So to start, yes, I, it's, it's a very long title that I have. I'm the director for the defense laboratories within a, the office of the uh, Secretary of Defense. It's a long title, you know, but uh, I guess the question, the question you would ask is, you know, so what does it mean to you? <laughs> and it probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you at all. It's just that uh, we have at the, uh, in the Department of Defense, we have a large number of laboratories within our, uh, within our enterprise, uh, over 63 labs, and we have about 39,000, actually over 39,000 scientists and engineers that work at those labs. And so I'm just going to give you today a, uh, a little bit of uh, an insight into what they do and things that, you, that you've probably experienced or you've worked with and how we, we look at that same, those same technologies. So in terms of, uh, the, the, of uh, technology, I mean, you probably don't realize that uh, a lot of the technology that's available to you today was a byproduct of uh, de Department of Defense uh, uh, development. So back in uh, you know, the World War II time, we, uh, the Department of Defense actually developed the first computer, the ENIAC, and they were using it basically just to look at, uh, to calculate traje artillery trajectories. So they wanted an automated method to take a look at when you launch a, uh, a, a munition, what the, what the parabolic trajectory would, uh, would be. And then there are other things, as simple as uh, duct tape. Duct tape, it's ubiquitous. Everyone uh, probably uses it. Uh, it's great to fix pretty much anything. It, uh, but it, another, it was another World War II era product that was developed. And uh, at the time, it was developed basically to keep our ammo cases uh, water, waterproof. So another use for duct tape, waterproofing. And then uh, GPS, everyone's got GPS. I think the picture's here. You know, it's like I'm not sure how many people even own GPS systems for cars nowadays. Pretty much the phone has taken over that, uh, that, uh, that, that job in, in, uh, when you're driving around. But GPS systems developed originally for uh, DOD, and it wasn't until probably around uh, the mid-'90s when uh, we turned, uh, I guess, off selective availability that you, uh, all, of the, all of the... Uh, the uh, private, private sector was able to take the technology within GPS and give you uh, accuracy to uh, just a few feet. So that, so that, was, that, that spawned that whole industry of the mapping uh, and the mapping aids software. And then finally, <coughs> Siri. Siri, you know, for those that are you know, Apple users, the, uh, the, you know, a, a very useful user interface for their, for their device. It was actually developed as part of a uh, program for, uh, within DOD, started at DARPA and uh, Stanford Research Institute, SR, SRI, and basically looking at how we could uh, take all of the technologies that, uh, that were going in, that were available at the time, and uh, take all of that computer technology and put on a user interface that would be uh, user friendly. So there are a number of technologies that you probably use today and uh, now um, are in uh, commercial sector, like uh, robotics. Robotics is a huge uh, area for technology. It's uh, it's all over the place. Uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned. Uh, um, ground vehicles, self-driving cars. Uh, there's a huge uh, application for robotics. And uh, so we have an application for robotics too. It's a, uh, in addition to all of those unmanned uh, applications, we're actually take, kind of taking a look at uh, how this technology could be used in space. So we, have, we launch a lot of satellites, but uh, the satellites have to survive for a very long time. If they break or something happens to them, there really is no way to, uh, to fix them right now. They become space junk, ostensibly. So we're looking at, well, why don't we, how about if we could take and develop a robotic vehicle that could actually uh, match up to the trajectory of the satellite in space and uh, connect to it and do repairs. If we could do that, there are a lot of uh, <clears throat> satellites we could fix in space, and then uh, that way they don't become space junk, just uh, littering the, uh, the, you know, littering our, our globe. Lasers, another uh, technology. It's uh, initially developed uh, out of uh, DOD. Um, <clears throat> so you see all the uses for lasers today. You got laser pointers. Uh, for those that have uh, bad eyesight, myself included, there's laser surgery that uh, is available to help uh, correct your eyesight. Um, lasers are used a lot in uh, manufacturing to do precision, uh, precision cutting, precision welding. And then we have a use as well. So we're taking a look at uh, lasers uh, in the military for, to, 
to help uh, shoot down uh, incoming projectiles. We're also looking at them to help uh, prevent, uh, I guess, uh, unwanted UAVs from entering various uh, airspace. So there are a number of ways you can take down a UAV, but they all tend to be uh, cost prohibitive. We could spend, we could spend four hundred thousand dollars on a missile to take down a UAV, but the UAV probably only cost a couple hundred dollars. So that's not a that's not a very good uh, um, exchange ratio that we would uh, care to take, care to undertake. So we're looking at the lasers for that uh, for that aspect to take down, to uh, to help take down uh, UAVs. That with a, with a laser and a laser system, it would probably cost around a, a dollar a shot. So we take down a UAV for a dollar. So now we're getting back to an exchange ratio, a cost per, uh, per defeat that uh, is more advantageous to us. Uh, a UAV is an unmanned air vehicle. <laughs> but <clears throat> that's one thing about uh, DOD. We have acronyms for everything. And we, can even, we, can even, we even have the ability to turn acronyms into nouns. So <clears throat> another, another thing about uh, uh, areas that we're working today is uh, looking at uh, uh, the speed of travel. So right now, you know, if you can navigate, you've managed to navigate all of the uh, the uh, the commercial air travel systems. You're looking at probably about uh, five hours to get uh, from here to the uh, the West Coast. Four hours around that time to get to uh, like Denver, that uh, kind of area. <clears throat> And uh, so we're looking at how we can uh, help uh, decrease that travel time. So the one thing is that you find that commercial airliners probably travel on the average about uh, 550 miles an hour. That's about their top speed. And they're balancing, they're balancing things like uh, um, the, their loads, the amount of fuel that they want to use or the, that they, they use for that, uh, that trip. And so they tra you know, it takes them about that time to get uh, at 550 miles an hour to get ac across the country. Now, if they go faster, what happens is that uh, you, you get uh, friction from, the, uh, from, uh, from heating. And so you, and it, that friction can get up to, if you go much faster, you can get up to almost the temperature of, uh, of uh, melting steel, molten, temp molten steel, about 3,500 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So what we what we'd like to do is we'd like to develop some some way to travel hypersonic travel that looks at uh, traveling at Mach six. If you travel at Mach six, now you're cutting down your travel time from here to California down to twenty from six hours down to twenty three minutes. But the problem you have with that is that all those systems that you're developing now have to be able to um, so all that uh, the uh, the aircraft system itself it has to be able to shield itself from temperatures upwards of uh, 3,000 degrees. So you don't want to melt your uh, system on the way. You, know, you, want your, you, you want that plane to still be there when you land in, uh, in, uh, in California after 23 minutes. <clears throat> Another area that uh, we really looking at, uh, we're really looking at technology is training. How to make uh, training better, how to make training more intuitive, how to, how to ensure our, ourselves that uh, the training that uh, people get, um, they, they, they keep, they understand, and they, uh, they retain that knowledge for longer periods of time. So we, we spend a, a, lot of our, uh, a lot of research looking at training methods, how to uh, take training, um, bring it into the, uh, the 21st, uh, 21st century using a lot of the, uh, the, the video uh, technology that we have available. So it's, it's one thing to know is that anyone can become a science and engineer. It's, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's just take it's some desire on your part. And I, I actually, I think, uh, Kate became interested in science and engineering back when, uh, probably was like, uh, it was an elementary school. It was uh, about seven or eight. And uh, at that time, there was, I, I knew that I, I, I liked tinkering. I would tinker with my bike, and I would tinker with anything else that, uh, you know, my parents didn't care that if, you know, if it broke, you know, they were okay. So it started with the tinkering, and it also started with uh, my dad, who, uh, actually, who was interested in uh, something called a Heath kit. That's another thing that you probably, uh, no one here has probably ever, well, the adults may have heard of them, but uh, I doubt any, anyone, uh, <clears throat> anyone that's in school now has ever heard of a Heath kit. It was a company that, uh, that developed, uh, they, would, they would develop products that you could actually build yourself at home. So you could uh, you could build if you if you so if, if you desired you could build a TV at home using a Heath kit, 
And uh, you can probably even find some on eBay. I'm not sure what they would go for, but <clears throat> you could build uh, TVs, you could build uh, radios. And uh, at that time, uh, my dad was working on a, uh, he was building a, uh, uh, a little handheld tool to look at the timing of a, uh, a, of a car. So it's another thing. Cars don't have timing belts anymore. So <clears throat> that's another thing that, uh, you know, as technology has advanced, <laughs> find less, you find things that, uh, that uh, aren't as readily available now. But uh, those, I really got my interest in that back then with uh, working with my dad and kind of tinkering with that and building some of the uh, devices that he was building. So, you know, it's like if you have an interest in tinkering, I think that's, uh, that's a great, that's a great uh, interest to inspire and to have because I think that, uh, um, you know, can lead you into a, uh, into a, STEM, uh, into a STEM field. And the other thing is uh, I, I know that uh, DOD sponsors this event. But uh, we, you know, it's like you don't need to join the military or you need to work for the Department of Defense. I think the nation, the, the nation as a whole, developed largely on, uh, largely, uh, on its uh, ability to innovate. From uh, all of the manufacturing that we did with automobiles in the, uh, in the 20s to all of our uh, electronic systems uh, now. Our, and our ability to uh, innovate has really been the, uh, the, the strength of, this, uh, of our nation. And I think uh, we, still, we still need that capability. And we need everyone, everyone, um, the, and the, the younger generation particularly, to take an interest in, uh, in, in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields. Because I think that, that is what is going to lead us to the next, uh, to the next re uh, revolution in, uh, in technologies. But there's, some very, there's lots of things uh, I know that, uh, the, that schools offer uh, that you can take part of. And I think you, you know, I challenge you that uh, you should take part of uh, any of those opportunities. And then there are opportunities outside of school associate, um, you know, like the VEX robot, robotics, uh, FIRST robotics. Um, there's uh, math counts. There's NASA kids clubs. There's, there's, there's lots of opportunities. And uh, I, I would hope, I would encourage that all of you take a look at those as opportunities and take, take a look at those opportunities and participate as much as uh, you can. <clears throat> and then I want to thank uh, the teachers and the parents that are in the audience for uh, actually bringing your, bringing your uh, kids or your students uh, to this event. Because I think uh, without, uh, without the, uh, both the parental influence and the teacher's influence, I think both of those are key to getting that next generation of uh, students interested in science and uh, science, math, engineering as well. And then uh, I think this is... This is my last slide. We have, uh, we, we actually do have a uh, website. Uh, the bottom one for uh, for the students in particular would be the, the one that's most the most important to you is the www.dodstem.us, and that's actually that site will add, will get you to all of the programs that uh, that the DoD runs in STEM, all the way from uh, K through uh, K through uh, graduate school. And uh, it'll get, it, it uh, not only is, um, so it'll give you links to um, programs that, the, uh, that uh, my office runs, but as well as programs that uh, run through the, uh, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force as well. And then if you uh, have an interest in, uh, in um, any of the, the platforms or the systems or the technology that DOD is uh, uh, working on, you can follow. Uh, we actually have a, uh, a Twitter feed, um, DOD, at DOD Innovation. And then we also have a site, uh, defenseinnovationmarketplace.mil, that uh, you can find out about uh, the, the technologies that, uh, that DOD is involved in. Looking at uh, some, of, some of the things that we're, some of the research that we're doing, we're taking a look at uh, how we, um, how nature does camouflage and how we can take that, uh, take what nature does, um, in, in this case, the, uh, the octopus, and replicate that in our systems. So that's a, that's a long-term research product, pro uh, project, but it uh, kind of gives you a glimpse of all the varied uh, areas that, uh, that we work in. <laughs>